For the dominion, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. If that isn't a reason to experience joy in and of itself, I don't know what is. This week, as our discussion group met to look at the scriptures that we'll be reading tonight, I asked the question what they thought was the opposite of joy. And as each person thought about this and started to respond, they gave answers that included things like grief and sadness, despair, living with loss. And none of these answers surprised me in the least. Because if you do a Google search at this point in time on the same topic, you'll see the exact same kind of responses at the very top of the list. And in fact, one very interesting twist on the theme revealed that the opposite of the term bundle of joy is adult. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. As we think about the difference between exuberant children and youth and adults, and what often takes place within us as we get older. Although I believe that all of these factors are a part of the larger answer, I would make one more suggestion. You see, I believe that the opposite of joy is fear. Fear is that thing that causes us to stop dead in our tracks. It seasons our hearts and our minds. It keeps them from moving forward. Fear worms itself into our lives through a number of different sources. Maybe past experiences that we've had, or negative self-talk when we tell ourselves that we couldn't really do something because we don't quite measure up in some way. There are so many ways that fear shows up in our lives. And that's part of what I was thinking about when I heard that quote that talked about bundle of joy and the adult. Sometimes our life experiences can be so harsh that it changes and it challenges that joy that we so freely experience as children. But no matter how it comes about or what the focus of our fear may be, there's one thing that's true in all circumstances surrounding fear. If we give in to it, if we listen to the fear and we hold back, we never will experience joy. This is true whether it's dealing with aspects of our families or putting our names forward for that job that we really want or taking a step in faith that takes us out of our own comfort zone. Fear of what others might think. Fear of making a mistake and sounding or looking like a fool. Fears that we're not really able to do something that we've always wanted to do. Are just some of the fears that rob us of happiness and of joy. While fear can serve a purpose for survival, helping us to identify those situations where we need to leave and leave quickly when something threatens us. It's not helpful for us as we live our daily lives and work to live them as God has called us to live them. Mark and I had an experience once while we were traveling. We were in Los Angeles and we had taken a trip off to Santa Barbara. We were enjoying dinner in a restaurant along the coast and had left and it was summertime and the sun was up late and we had lost track of time and had been walking along and thought, let's walk back along the beach. There are these stairways that led from the street level down into the beach. And it was getting darker than we never thought. And we entered into a stairway. And we got what I would call beyond past the point of no return, where to turn around it would feel odd and strange, and into this small little spot where from the bottom you couldn't see up and from the top you couldn't see down. And there was an individual 
walking slowly up the steps. And I remember in that circumstance the energy that was existent in that space. And there was a good bit of distance between us at that point in time. And I remember just saying to Mark, move fast. And we did. And it was okay. But the two of us remember that experience as one where we were typical tourists and simply didn't think, didn't know that it wasn't going to be just a straightforward staircase going down to the beach. So fear was helpful for us at that point in time to keep us going and to keep us out of a situation of potential harm. But if we live our entire lives from a place of fear, of that same kind of paralyzing fear, then one of the things that we will not experience is the joy that God has to offer for us. This is reflected throughout the Bible, and we heard it in Isaiah's words as he was speaking to the people of Israel, saying, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Isaiah was speaking to the people, reminding them in a poetic way of how God loved them. And how God had been with them throughout traumatic times in the past. The poetic references about walking through water and over fire weren't actually meant to be taken literally, but rather as a reminder that God looked out for the people in the past and that God promises to look out for the people once more. This is a message that holds true for us today as well, not just the people of Israel. Simply put, don't get caught up in our fears. Remember that God who knows us by name is with us. Each and every one of us. God knows us by name. Fear is such a strong motivator for certain action and inaction in our lives. When fear is keeping us from growing, from experiencing the glories that God has in store for us, or from being our best selves, because we might have to do something that others question, then fear steals our joy. Look at the example of the shepherds who were out in the field watching their sheep on the night that Jesus was born. Here they were, out on a dark night, probably talking to one another in hushed tones, as it seems that a dark night calls for. If you've ever been camping, sitting around a campfire, when out of the darkness, an angel of God appeared, all of a sudden, boom, was there. And not only appeared, but the glory of God shone all around this person, this angel, from darkness thrust into light in an instant. Here was a group that society would never have put into the soft spotlight, the shadows, and all of a sudden they were seeing this luminous being. They weren't used to having to talk to many to many people within society, let alone talking to angels. Even after all that had gone on, they were in their own minds and in society's minds lesser than. And out of the middle of the darkness came this light, came this being. You see, the shepherds, they didn't follow all of the religious laws. Part of it was because they simply couldn't. They couldn't observe the Sabbath, for example, and because they were working, they were with their animals. No matter how they might try, they were constantly touching and handling dirty sheep. And literally, they lived on, on the edge of society. And all of a sudden, on a regular night, 
the bright angel appears out of nowhere. And we read, and if you look at a number of different um, versions of the Bible, it says it pretty much in the same way. They were terrified by what they saw. Their fear kicked in immediately. It would have been so easy in that circumstance or that situation to run, to strike out at the angel or to do any number of things out of fear and out of terror. And we have to believe that the angel understood this as the very first thing that the angel said was, don't be afraid. Let me tell you some really good news. And then, to top it off, even more angels showed up. And they started to sing and to share God's glory. Just imagine the, the situation for a moment. If you were that shepherd, sitting in that field, in that darkness, and all of a sudden the sky is made bright, and all of these voices were singing for you. It's obvious from the story that the shepherds didn't give another thought to their fears. There were so many things that could have held them back. But no, they didn't give in to their fears. Fears of others thinking that maybe they were crazy, maybe they had slipped some kind of mushroom into the stew that they had put together that night. <laughs> Seeing heavenly angels appearing out of nowhere. Hearing whole choirs of angels of having the nerve to enter the town directly from the fields without ritually cleansing themselves first, or of being worthy enough to cast their gaze upon the face of the baby. The scriptures tell us that they were all in agreement. Let's go and see this thing that has happened, they said. Imagine the joy that they experienced there is no typical discussion. Well, shall we set aside a committee to talk about this vision that we just saw and weigh out the pros and the cons? Do we go, who stays with the sheep? Who goes and gets to see? What route shall we take? I think I-95 is better. I'm going to take the Trans-Canada one. None of that whatsoever. Everybody together said, let's go and see this thing that has happened. Imagine the joy that they experienced and the stories that they would tell for years to come. The lowest within society being invited to see the face of God in the form of this little baby. That's what joy does. It transforms us from the regular humdrum aspects of our lives, and it releases us from those things that make us afraid. It makes us feel like we can walk on water, that we can climb the highest mountain, or dare to be in places that others might not <coughs> be are good enough to go. Joy helps us to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be. And joy is what God wants for each and every one of us. Just like the shepherds of the field, we are reminded that to truly experience joy, we have to work for it. Though. Not only by overcoming our fear, but taking steps to realize that joy. For some of us, if we were the shepherds, it might have been enough just to experience the angels that night. Imagine a heavenly choir singing just for us. It could have been tempting to sit back and to remember the beautiful music, doing our very best to capture it on our flutes and our small musical instruments that we have with us. But that wouldn't, separate, wouldn't satisfy the shepherds. They went to see the child. I'd even bet that there wasn't a complaint that very night 
but the distance that they would have to walk going into town and then back and again. I wonder if they even felt in the ground. They did the work that they needed to experience their full joy in that time and in that space. And we need to do the same. Whether it's stopping the whirl of our lives and taking time to see God's handiwork through nature, being thankful and in awe of the glory that God has created all around us, or turning an otherwise upsetting experience of a mundane aspect of life. We've all had those experiences in the airport where the hour delay turns into an 11-hour experience. And we have an opportunity to use that time to meet and to talk with people that we never ever would have mixed or mingled with before. We never would have met otherwise. If we're open to joy. If we're open to experiencing that moment and seeing the possibility of the joy that exists within it. And then engaging. You can't very well meet people if you stay sitting in your seat expecting everybody to come to you. Whatever the case, we need to be open to noticing and absorbing and also contributing to the joy that's all around us. Christmas is a reminder to hold on to joy for all of us who walk the Christian spiritual path. Christmas is also a reminder for us to practice joy, to share it with others. May we all be blessed with joy and take joy out into our worlds.